the sort of world in which Amos was living. It was an age of luxury and pleasure. Uh, one of the books says that it was the golden age of Israel and the people had never had it so good. And so in chapter 6 of Amos, from verse 4 onwards, you get an idea of just what society was like. There in verse 4, you see the people stretching themselves on their beds inlaid with ivory. You see them eating the best animals from the flock and the choicest calves from the stall. In verse 5, they are bawling their heads off, singing idle songs, and inventing for themselves all sorts of new ways of entertainment. In verse 6, they are filling the bowls with wine and covering themselves with perfume and aftershave lotion and talcum powders and all the rest of it anointing themselves with the finest of oils, and you say, what's wrong with that? Well, you see, 400 years before this, there was a man called Samuel. And when Samuel was alive, there were no kings amongst God's people. There were only judges. And life was simple under Samson and Jephthah and Barak and Deborah and so on. But in time, you see, the people began to get tired of these judges and tired of the simple life. And so they came to Samuel, and he was an old man by this time, and they said, we want a king. Samuel said, you can't have a king because God is your king. And that's the way God wants it. If you want the big word, girls, God's people were meant to be a theocracy. That's a nation governed by God. Now said Samuel, God is your king, and the judges will rule you, but you can't have a king for yourselves. And the people said, we must have a king, because all the other nations have kings, the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Ammonites, and the Moabites. They've got kings, and we want to be like them. Samuel said, God didn't choose you to be like them. God chose you to be different from them. And I warn you, said Samuel, if you choose a king, he'll want a palace, he'll want wives, he'll want horses, he'll want an army, He'll want fields and vineyards. He'll want pastry cooks and confectioners and bakers. And the day will come when you cry to God to take away this king. Well, they got their king. The first one was called Saul, and he finished up mad. Worse than mad, he finished up demon-possessed. Second king was David, and if you know your Bible, you'll know what a mess he made of his life with Bathsheba, murder, and worse. And the next king was Solomon, and Solomon was so extravagant with his wives and horses and armies and all the rest of it and his great palace and the magnificent temple he built 
in Jerusalem that when he died, the people got sick to death of Solomon's son and the nation split in two. Four hundred years after Samuel, the people are stretching themselves on beds of ivory and on their couches, eating the finest meat, drinking the wine, playing on musical instruments. And God sends Amos to condemn them. Now you see, our theme is tonight a Christian lifestyle. You see, the trouble is we always want more. We always want bigger and we always want better. There's a, there's a, there's a spiral here. The, the big word is escalation. But our pleasures and our delights and our tastes always tend to escalate so that this year you've got one car and next year you'll have two cars and the year after that you'll have a, two cars and a yacht or a catamaran, or a caravan. This year you've got a gramophone. Next year you'll have a stereogram. The year after that you'll have quadraphonic sound. <laughs> and in five years' time you'll have decaphonic sound. That's the next thing. Ten loudspeakers in all the rooms and the sound bombarding you from every direction. Now you see, the trouble is, our hearts are factories of desire and the desires keep escalating and escalating that's what's happened to these women you see the, 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 the men and the women stretching themselves in luxurious beds and pouring the wine down their throats and covering themselves with perfumes and ointments and Amos condemns them now you see our theme tonight is a Christian lifestyle. How should Christians live in a world where this, this pleasure escalation thing is at work? And it's so important a subject, you know, that there are two splendid books on the market. You can find one in Britain. It's called Enough is Enough. Uh, the point of the book is that we spend far too much on food and drink and clothes and pleasure and gadgets and gimmicks and all the rest of it. And Christians ought to de-escalate their lives. We should now be screwing downwards towards a simple lifestyle. That's the first book, Enough is Enough. I can't remember the author offhand. I think someone knows it. Karen, do you know it, Karen? John Taylor, yes. It's, it's, it's an IVF book. I thought it was IVF. Oh, can't be SCM. They've gone out of business now. Um, enough is enough. The second book, which is not yet published in this country, but I bought it when I was over in America in March. It's by Schaefer, the famous man Schaefer. And it's called, How Should We Then Live? He's written several books about the... The, the collapse of Western Christian culture and Western Christian philosophy. And this is his final book now, you see. He'll write more, but it's the final book of that series. Um, and he's saying, now, if that's what's happened in Western Christendom, how should Christians live? So the theme is not just lifestyles, but also protests. Because, in a sense, you see, Christianity is a protest movement. C.S. Lewis, Lewis calls it an underground movement. It's, it's guerrilla warfare. We're in a foreign country. This world is not our home. And the man or the woman who becomes a Christian really becomes a kind of guerrilla soldier. And we've got to work underground and fight hard. Because this as yet is not Christ's land. It's not Jesus' country. Now let me, let, let me 
give you a picture which will help you to understand why Christians should be against the escalation. I want you to imagine a great big circle. And this circle is the Greek theory of history. This is what the Greeks believed about history. This is how history works. They said all empires go in circles. Round the circle put three words. Two of them you can find in an English dictionary because they're English words, although they came from Greek. The first word is Genesis, which is birth or the beginning of something. A third the way round, you put the word hubris, H-U-B-I-R-S. And that's the Greek word for pride. And two-thirds the way round, you put the Greek word nemesis. You'll find that in an English dictionary too. And it means death, or disintegration, or a falling apart. The wheel turns, Genesis, the nation is born. It grows to the point of hubris. That's pride. It becomes proud. Uh, people live in luxury. Vice begins to escalate. Hubris, pride. History turns, the wheel turns, and then comes Nemesis, which is the, the death of the nation and the death of the empire. Now, I'm pretty sure that every empire that has existed in the world has gone through this cycle. It's, it's almost a relentless cycle. And you know who's turning the wheel? Well, who's the king of this universe? Not Jesus. Not yet. It's the devil. Three times Jesus called him the prince of this world. He turns the wheel. Paul calls him even more graphically the prince of the power of the air. And he turns the wheel. Nations are born, they grow proud, independent, worldly, corrupt, rotten. And then the wheel turns and they die. And that's true, I think, of every nation. Persia, <clears throat> Babylon and Assyria, Egypt. If we're not too long, you'll see the end of Cleopatra when you get home. It's on tonight. She, you see, was at the tail end of Egypt's disintegration. You see, she was selling herself to Rome. That's the whole point of, point of the story, that she could no longer keep the empire of Egypt together. It was all falling to pieces. And so she had to have various affairs with Antony and Julius Caesar in order to sort of hold the kingdom together. And finally, the whole place had to be sold to Rome. Genesis, hubris, nemesis and the devil turning the wheel now because this is so the gospel is a protest movement and Christians are not part of this system God has saved us out of this system and this is why in our own generation Christians will have to think and rethink very 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 hard how they ought to live in a society which is part of this awful genesis hubris it, nemesis wheel turning, turning, turning now lots of people you see have, have tried to do it can I give you some examples actually we can go before the birth of Christ to a man who tried to opt out of this. He was called Diogenes. You heard of Diogenes? He's the man who lived in a barrel. In, yes, he did. 
And he lived to the age of over 90, so there's a lesson there somewhere. <laughs> to what do you attribute your long life? I lived in a battle. Now, he's famous for that. But why did he live in a battle? Well, you see, you need to think of the other thing that he did. Somebody caught him one night going through the streets of Athens with a candle and said, Hello, Diogenes, what are you doing, you crazy old man? He said, I'm looking for a righteous man in Athens. And he couldn't find one. Because, you see, Greece at that point had reached hubris. Pride, the glory that was Greece, was already dying by the time Diogenes uh, lived. And so, you see, he opted out and uh, started living an ascetic life in a tub. And that's why uh, so many uh, Christian hippies have tried to set up an alternative lifestyle. You find them all over the highlands, actually, on, on islands, queer islands, and queer little groups growing their own corn, and building their own house, and having their own well for water, and making their own clothes. <laughs> it's painfully obvious that they made their own clothes. You know, some of the girls who look as though they were wearing wigwams, someone wrote to Esther Ranson and television said that nowadays she looked as though she were wearing wigwams. I must say that they don't look like dresses, do they? Well, there they are, you see. Now, you see, it's a, it's a protest movement. What they really are saying is, we're getting back to nature. We want to go back to a simple lifestyle because we're sick of a society that sprawls on ivory beds and drinks bowls of wine and anoints itself with ointment. We're sick of all that worldliness and corruption and we want to opt out. Our brother here, I'm going to take his name in vain, Dan Monroe has just been to Pennsylvania and you know that that's where you find the Amish sect um, who live in an otherworldly world. Um, no buttons. They don't believe in buttons for some strange reason. Everything's held together with pins, you see. They don't uh, believe in electricity. Don't use it. They don't have cars. They don't have radios or television sets. The ladies all wear um, long, long skirts. And the men's coats are buttoned together, not with buttons, because they don't believe in buttons, but with hooks and eyes. Now, you may think that's very bizarre, and I think they are very bizarre, but you see, they're a protest movement against the hubris and the corruption of society. And they're sort of respectable hippies. like the Puritans in the 17th, 18th, 18th century they wore black clothes why did they wear black clothes? well they thought that wearing colors was gaudy and effeminate and, and worldly and carnal so they went around the streets uh, wearing black clothes and black knee breeches and the, their only concession to vanity was the wonderful lace that they wore at the cuffs and round their necks. The one concession to vanity. Simple lifestyle. Now I'll ask you, what's wrong with all these movements? Hippies opting out and living in Christian communes. Puritans with black clothes trying, trying to disappear in the blackness of their clothes. Or the Amish sect. Or Diogenes living in his tub. You know, what's wrong with all these movements? Eventually, they all end up by saying, Look at me! They sort of undo their purpose. They start off, you see, trying to be consecrated and separate and special for God. 
And they finish up by saying, look at me. And they undo their purpose. Now you see, there is an answer to that if you're looking for a lifestyle, because there are protest movements and protest people in the Bible, and they don't say, look at me. They say, look at him. Now, how can we find a Christian lifestyle that will be so attractive to the world that the world won't be so interested in what we are eating or drinking or not eating or drinking and the clothes we are wearing so that they'll look at us and say, Oh, look at him. Not look at them, but look at him. Well, lots of people had it. In the Old Testament, there were Nazarites. Samson was a Nazarite. And the mark of their separation and protest was that they never shaved. They had long beards, long hair. Remember Samson with his long hair. There was another group called the Rechabites. They never drank wine. They wouldn't even eat currants or raisins or sultanas in case they had fermented and they would drink alcohol, you see, as they were eating the currants and the raisins. That was the mark of their separation. But they weren't saying, look at us. They were saying, look at Jehovah. Because they were doing it for God. Of course, the most famous one is John the Baptist. Look at John the Baptist in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. I have two more readings after this, if you um, care to turn them up later on. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. And John's in jail now, you see, thrown in there by Herod. Matthew 11 and verse 7. Now you remember that John the Baptist had a rather strange lifestyle. He opted out. And he went to the desert and lived on locusts and wild honey and dressed himself in animal skins. Rather a bizarre character. But it was his way of saying, not me, him. Always pointed to Jesus. You see, the crowds came to John out in the desert. The difference between John and Jesus is very obvious. Jesus went amongst the people in the villages and the towns and the festivals to the feasts. Jesus was always there amongst the people, the hurly burly of life. John the Baptist went away into the wilderness, way, way over the moors. And the people went to John. Jesus went to the people. John the Baptist stood alone. And when the people went to John the Baptist, <laughs> he must have had Irish blood in him. Because he then said, not me, him. Behold, the Lamb of God, this is he who was before me. I'm not worthy to unloose the latchet of his shoes. Not me, him. And so there was constant movement. People came to John, listened to his preaching, and then he lost all his disciples and his followers. They drifted away from him, and nobody was more pleased than himself. Wonderful. Chapter 11 and verse 7. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What, what did you go out into the wilderness to behold? A reed shaken by the wind. Why then did you go out? To see a man clothed in soft raiment? A soft lifestyle? Behold, those who wear soft raiment are in king's houses. Why then did you go out? 
to see a prophet? Yes, I tell you, but more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, and these are words from the Old Testament, and they're a promise of a second Elijah, because John the Baptist is the second Elijah. Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, who shall prepare thy way before thee. Truly I say to you, amongst those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist, and yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and men of violence take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied up till the coming of John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their playmates, children playing games. And first of all, they play at weddings. Do children still play at weddings? Do children play at all now, do they? You don't see them playing in the streets very often. Maybe they just watch television. Maybe that's games nowadays. We were always playing at weddings, cowboys and Indians and all the rest of it, and funerals as well. So, Jesus says, What a spoiled lot of bairns you are. You don't know what kind of games you want to play. 17. We have piped to you. This is them playing weddings. But you did not dance. You didn't want to play weddings. You didn't want a jolly religion. We wailed. They're playing at funerals now. But you did not mourn. You didn't want to play funerals. You didn't want a religion of repentance. You don't want a religion of joy. You don't want a religion of repentance. You are like a lot of spoiled children. You don't know what you want. 18. For John came. Neither eating nor drinking. He was ascetic, you see. That was his lifestyle. He stood apart like Diogenes on the hippies. And they said, Oh, he has a demon. That man's not right. Standing out there in the sand, preaching his head off. He's not right. What a queer preacher. He has a demon. The Son of Man came. This is Jesus. Eating and drinking. He wasn't an ascetic. He loved life. And they said, <laughs> Behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. Will you turn to Mark chapter 2? Still thinking of how we should live Mark chapter 2 and verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. You see, the Pharisees were ascetic too, like John the Baptist. Very narrow, very strict. That was their lifestyle. And people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? Why do they live like that? But your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? That's himself. He's the bridegroom. As long as they have the bridegroom with them on earth, as long as Jesus was with them on earth, they cannot fast. Now, this is very important. 
The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. Jesus goes away and because he's gone away our lifestyle must change. Our lifestyle must get narrower. 1 Corinthians 7, we'll finish with this. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, a great chapter this, it's about marriage. All married couples should read it very carefully. And unmarried couples, not unmarried couples, you can't have unmarried couples, that's not allowed. But unmarried people should read it as well, it's a very useful chapter. You see, the, the, the thing is detachment. It's the chapter that preaches detachment. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now here's a lifestyle for you. Uh, verse, where are we? 29. I mean, brethren... The appointed time has grown very short. That's the time of Christ's coming. Some people think it's the time of our death, which is getting short too. We're all nearer death now than we were at half past six. We are an hour nearer death. We're also an hour nearer Christ's coming. So that's the appointed time. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. Now here's how to live. And this determines how we spend our money and uh, how much we should spend on luxuries. Things like, here we go, aftershave lotion and, and perfume. I don't think you should buy these things for yourself. You should wait until Christmas and let someone else buy them, buy them for you. That's nice because they're so... That's so expensive, you see. Uh, I think questions, Christians ought to think twice about paying £20 for a seat in a theatre, as was the case recently. Uh, I wouldn't pay £20 for a seat in a theatre, even if the Maharaja of Kathmandu were to be there, uh, far less uh, Prince Charles or Princess Alexandra but I think every Christian who went to Eden Court that night should have put 20 pounds into the collection bag for Jesus the following Lord's Day. How many did? Well, Jesus is a wee bit more than Prince Charles, surely. This sort of lifestyle determines how you spend your money. The sort of clothes you wear, you know, it's very, very important, especially young people. The sort of clothes you wear. I don't think young people should wear provocative clothes. Because I think it's, it's worse than dangerous. It's wicked. It's wicked to go, up, to go around in provoking appetites and instincts in, in other Christians. I think it's a wicked thing to do. Not that we should look like frumps or, or, uh, or, or dowdy. There used to be a famous coat at the Keswick Convention. And this missionary society handed it on from generation to generation. It was one of these old-fashioned long leather coats that were fashionable in the 1920s. And it was their pride, you see, that they were all so humble on the mission field and so hard up that they had to keep on handing this coat from generation to generation. And year after year it kept turning up at the Keswick Convention. Do you know what that was? That wasn't a look at Jesus phenomenon. That was a look at me phenomenon. If you want a lifestyle of detachment, here it is. It, it will determine the sort of friends you choose. 
and the sort of pleasures you go in for, whether you put paint on your face, girls, and how much paint you put on your face, because there are subtle ways of doing it, as well as unsubtle ways of doing it. Lifestyle. Detachment, very, 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 very Im important. You see the wheels turning in our generation. Britain is at the hubris point. Some might say she was round to nemesis. Some might say we were falling to pieces and our nation was disintegrating. Maybe nemesis has come over us. We certainly have been hubris. We've been very sure and cocky of ourselves over the years of the British Empire, expecting that the world should speak English. You notice how we expect everyone to speak English. I do believe that if we landed in Outer Mongolia, we would get out of the train and start speaking English to the natives, you see, as if they could speak English. British Empire, relic of the British Empire, all that, all that sort of thing. Well, maybe we are into Nemesis. Well, how are we supposed to live as Christians? People who belong to Christ, people who are separated from Jesus Christ, how do we live? 1 Corinthians 7, 29. I mean, brethren, the appointed time has grown very short. From now on, oh, this is fun. Let those who have wives live as though they had none. Don't allow yourself to be so trochled with the problems of marriage that you lose your separation. Uh, verse 30. <clears throat> uh, let those who have wives live as though they'd none. <clears throat> let those who mourn be as though they were not mourning. They haven't to allow their grief and their cares to disturb their separation. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. Wonderful. What a way to live if we could cultivate this art. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the form of this word world. The Greek word is schema, from which we get the English scheme. This system of things, the scheme of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. And if we learn to live like this, you see that was the point of Amos protest, if we learn to live like this, people won't say, we do it well, oh, look at him, or look at her, isn't she holy, isn't she full of self-righteousness, isn't she full of herself? They won't say that about us, although unfortunately they can say it about so many Christians, they're so full of self-righteousness. They won't say, oh, look at him, look at her. They'll say, mercy, look at Jesus. Which, after all, is what we want them to do. Amen. May God bless his word. <clears throat>